Um, we have a sign up. So if you are here and uh, you can, if you haven't signed yet the sign up sheet, then do so either like on the way out maybe or on your way to get foods right by the food. And also um, feel free to take these snacks are for you. So, um, you know, refresh yourselves. It's a reward. So uh, go take advantage. And um, um, the other thing is that um, <clears throat> if you are online, then um, I think we have maybe 10 people online, something like that. And uh, so um, Stacy uh, Freeman will be uh, monitoring questions that might come through online so that she could ask them um, when we do questions. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I'm inter I'm, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Mark Shotwell. He's uh, been, he says you're in your 30th year in the Department of Biology at Slippery Rock University. He teaches genetics as well as a course called Social and Ethical Issues in Genetics, which arose from his longstanding interest in the eugenics movement. He has recently, recently published two articles in the American Biology Teacher on the misuse of Mendelian genetics by eugenicists. So that's what he's going to talk to us. I've, I've known uh, Dr. Shotwell for probably like five years now, but I met him once before this. <laughs> and I stopped at Slippery Rock, and uh, when I, uh, he was telling me a little bit about how to teach uh, the history of genetics, and he loaned me some books, which um, maybe he gave them to me. Did he loan them to me? Because I didn't I, ever give them back. I haven't uh, seen them in five sure. years. I didn't bring them today, so you. I think I'm keeping them. I wasn't expecting to get them back, so I, I must have okay. given them to you. The, the bindings are a little weak, and they've kind of fallen apart. Okay. But I still have them. And I also want to thank uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, Stacy Freeman, who is also sponsoring this with me, and the DEI committee that uh, provided uh, all of this uh, food for you and is sponsoring this as well. So um, thank you to, to them. And um, that's it. Take away. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the invitation. As you can see from my title, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Uh, scientific racism, uh, focusing on Charles Davenport and his concern over what he called race intermingling. So uh, these, uh, I'm going to tell you about events that occurred a very long time ago, uh, uh, really about 100 years ago or a little bit more. Uh, one particular eugenicist, but the eugenics movement in general. Um, what he attempted to do was to use the new science of genetics to support his claims that uh, certain uh, groups were superior to others, in particular that white people, of which he was definitely one, were, were genetically superior to African Americans, blacks. I'm going to use, I think I'm going to use the term black. Um, he tried to use the new science of, of genetics, a, a genuine science, to support his racist claims. Again, it happened over 100 years ago, and you might think, well, why would anybody want, you want to think about it after 100 years? There are lessons to be learned from this, and I'm going to try to touch on that really towards the end. Um, I will tell you that the I, Davenport oftentimes is described as somebody who just was not a good person at all because of his uh, racism and sexism and all the other isms that he brought to his work and that he, he um, helped, helped found and establish the field of eugenics, which was a, a shameful episode in the history of, of science. But, I would rather think that Davenport and the other eugenicists had good intentions. It's hard to do that, but they genuinely thought that they could improve the human species, the human race, by using the latest science, which was genetics. Unfortunately, um, their biases and their bad science undermine the whole thing, and it's largely discredited. Anyway, let me get into it. So eugenics, lots of ways to define it. Um, in brief, it's a way. The idea is to improve the overall genetic quality of the human race by controlling matings, deciding who has children with whom, to select parents that will then result in superior offspring. It's traced back to Sir Francis Galton, an, an Englishman from the Victorian era, um, who came up with the idea and first wrote about it in the year 1866 which coincidentally was the year that, that Mendel published his one and only paper, so there are coincidences here. And he named it eugenics in 1883. Uh, fun fact to know and tell, Francis Galton was the half-cousin of Charles Darwin. They had a grandfather in common, but different grandmothers, so they were half-cousins. All right, so two aspects of it. One is positive eugenics. That sounds good, positive eugenics. That is identifying people in the population who are superior the people at the upper end of the uh, scale, and somehow finding a way to encourage them to have more children. 
Um, Galt was certainly in favor of that. He proposed such things as identifying those upper crust people who were people like him and paying for their weddings or giving them allowances for each child they had. But eugenics in the United States in particular really focused way, way more on negative eugenics. That would be identifying the people at the other end of the scale, the people that that uh, Galton and others in Davenport and eugenicists thought ought not to be having children, identifying them and finding ways to keep them from having children, to dissuade them or to prevent them altogether. If you want to ask later, in fact, you can ask any questions you want during this, but if you want to ask later, I can tell you more about how negative eugenics worked in this country. I, I, I don't have time to cover the whole field. I just want to focus on, on uh, Davenport. But if you want to know how they went about that, I can certainly tell you. OK, so you can say that it started in 1866, and Galton developed his ideas through the rest of the 19th century. But it was very slow to catch on for a couple of reasons. One is people weren't really terribly in favor of paying the upper crust, the highly educated, to have more children. No. No, who's, who wants to do that? Moreover, uh, the Church of England was against it, and religious leaders in, in, in general were against it. And another big reason was that Galton's conception of heredity, which I'm not going to try to explain, simply didn't work with eugenics. There just wasn't any way to come up with a, an effective program of eugenics based on his conception of heredity. It just didn't work, and he realized that. So then what happened, the Mendelian Revolution? As some of you probably have learned, uh, Gregor Mendel um, did crosses and peas and other plants in the 1850s and 60s. He wrote his one and only scientific paper, as I said, uh, came out in 1866. Almost nobody read it. It wasn't until the year 1900 that, that it became apparent what he was up to. So it's a famous story in the history of science that in 1900, uh, other biologists rediscovered Mendel and genetics is, I think, unique among all sciences in that we know when it started and the year was 1900. So uh, Mendelian genetics made all the difference. So Galton's kind of vague statistical concept was replaced with Mendelian genetics, which is known as hard genetics. Everything became a Mendelian trait. So here's what I, I mean by uh, hard heredity and a Mendelian trait. First of all, factors of inheritance passed from parents to offspring, unchanged, unblended. They're not mixed in the offspring. They stay separate. They stay, they stay discrete. Separate factors pass intact, not blended, and not affected by environmental conditions. A good analogy, it's an old one, but it's a good one, like beads on a string. Like beads on a string pass generation to generation to generation, not affected by the environment. That's hard heredity. Factors of inheritance. So early eugenicists saw everything as a Mendelian trait, meaning it's inherited, okay? Whatever trait they saw in humans, inherited with a gene that causes it, as we'll see later, with a dominant and recessive allele, and no major influence of, of the environment. Mendelian traits, everything, everything. So now it seemed to be possible to improve the overall heredity of the human race by identifying traits, knowing, actually assuming that they were Mendelian traits. So there are good genes and bad genes. There are people that had good heredity and people had bad heredity, these Mendelian factors. You couldn't do anything about it with the environment, whether it was education or nutrition or sanitation, nope. The only way you could do things about it is over time, control meetings so that the good genes spread through the population and the bad genes were, were weeded out. That was the idea. Again. Uh, it's easy, very easy to look at eugenesis, which is, you know, we're talking about close to 100 years ago and say they were bad people or they were stupid people or they were just evil people even. But again, I try to give them a little bit of benefit of the doubt as they thought they were using the latest science to improve society and to eliminate some of these ills. So they had a whole bunch of things in society that they wanted to eliminate. Insanity, alcohol, they lumped all these together, poppers. They, for example, thought that being poor was a hereditary trait. They called it pauperism, that you inherited genetic factors that made it so that you could not make money and you were, you were going to be poor the rest of your life and so were your children, pauperism. Likewise with criminality, there were born criminals. Sexual deviance. The feeble-minded is, is the one uh, American eugenicists spent the most time on. I'm not going to really say a whole lot about that. Immigrants, another key aspect of the American eugenics movement is um, attempts to keep uh, people from certain countries 
notably Southern and Eastern Europe, out of the United States under the assumption that they had bad heredity, that they were um, hereditarily unintelligent, and ethnic minorities. That's what I'm going to focus on today. It's going to take me a while to get there, though, so, so bear with me. So now we have to get into some racism. And I, this makes me uncomfortable every time I talk about it. I'm talking about history. Still, after all this time, all these years talking about it, it makes me uncomfortable. But it is a fact that the American eugenicists and the British eugenicists, eugenicists in general, and quite frankly, the majority of the population of, of the United States and Great Britain thought, believed that black people were intellectually inferior. Galton himself concluded that black people were two grades below the average white person intelligence, which today would be roughly 20 IQ points. That's what he said. That's what he wrote. I'm not going to tell you based on what. So that bias was there. The eugenicists didn't make that up. That was very common in society at the time. It therefore seemed that if you're going to improve the human race, you had to worry about black people, in particular black people mating with white people, having children with white people. That was a really bad idea because it would drag the white race down at the, uh, by, by allowing this to happen. Um, and they, can, they compared it to what would happen if you had, for example, a thoroughbred horse and you allowed it to mate with some other random horse. Or if you had a purebred dog and it mated with a mutt. This was the kind of thinking that was very common in those days. So I want to say a little bit about Charles Benedict Davenport, probably the premier American eugenicist. Let me say just a little bit about him. Lots of things I could say. There he was, good looking guy, you have to admit. Uh, he was highly educated and the, the American eugenicists in general were very highly educated. They were uh, white Anglo-Saxon men, highly educated at all the best universities. Uh, he was educated at a place called Harvard, maybe you've heard of that. Other eugenicists were from Princeton and Stanford and all the top universities. Um, he was trained as a zoologist, and he uh, studied heredity in the early days of genetics, shortly after the turn of the 20th century, when the Mendelian uh, concept became known. The question was, is that just in peas? Is it just in plants? Does it, is it in, in animals? Do they have this sort of heredity? So he was one of the first to extend Mendelian principles to other animals, including mammals. <laughs> Uh, and he wanted, of course, to think about heredity in humans. A lot of geneticists, they really are interested in human heredity, but it's difficult to study, so they start with other animals. He wanted to know about heredity in humans. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say he was the first true human geneticist. So he studied uh, some fairly uh, str simple, straightforward traits, eye color, hair color. Things like that, skin pigmentation, things that could be easily seen and measured in people. And he tried to figure out the pattern of inheritance. Here is from his book that I have. I didn't bring it with me because it's falling apart. Uh, at the beginning of the book, he shows this uh, different eye colors. He, he concluded there's a handful, two or three genes that determine a person's eye color from no color at all, all the way to black. He was the first person to try to put that on a genetic basis. He published several papers. Here's one on heredity of skin pigmentation, which he published with his wife. I always thought this was interesting. He gave his wife first authorship. Wasn't that nice? Gertrude was her name. She got to be the first author on this paper, skin pigmentation. Again, concluding small number of genes determine skin pigmentation. And like a lot of things with Davenport, he was kind of right, but he was he oversimplified. And it's way more complicated than that. Yes. All right. He, he became interested in eugenics. He actually was in England and he met Galton and he devoted the rest of his life to eugenics. When it came to eugenics and American eugenics, Davenport had a key role as a fundraiser. He was a genius at getting rich people to give him money to support this. He was a fundraiser and organizer. He helped uh, establish scientific, pseudo scientific societies and, and run meetings. But the money was key. And he got money from the Harriman family on Long Island. Um, the widow of a, a railroad magnate gave Davenport money to establish the eugenics record office on Long Island, Cold Spring Harbor, the ERO, the center of American eugenics. It was to uh, conduct research, but 
far beyond that, it had the role of collecting eugenic information. It was a storehouse. It was a depository of uh, information that was to be useful to eugenicists. And it was supposed to organize education. So eugenics, in a way, was almost like a religion. And Davenport was, in a way, the high priest of eugenics in the United States. So once these eugenical truths became known, then they wanted to publicize that across the entire country and persuade people that eugenics was the route to improving uh, the human species and improving life, to, to eliminate all these horrible inherited diseases and all these other social ills, alcoholism, poverty, that it was eugenics and people needed to be educated about that. Uh, they trained uh, field workers, usually young women, who would go out to various places, uh, homes, asylums, hospitals, and collect information. It turns out the vast majority of the information was of absolute no use at all, but they thought it was. They would bring it back to uh, the genetics record office and catalog it. Catalog it. So the ERO in, in Colesbury Harbor became just a storehouse of this vast amount of information, which, by the way, still exists. Very little of it was of any use, but nevertheless, that's what they did. You think, oh, what did they look at? Height, weight, eye color, things like that, easily measurable. But they went far beyond that and tried to collect information about things like well, athletic ability, how? But trustworthiness, patriotism, how? They thought all of these were Mendelian traits controlled by single genes with a dominant allele and a recessive. The pattern of inheritance was simple. We're going to figure it out. We're going to get all this information. We're going to figure it all out. We're going to use it to design truly effective eugenics programs. And the one that always comes up is feeble-mindedness. If you've never heard this term before and you want a definition from me, you're not going to get one because it was a catch-all. It was all sorts of things. All sorts of things from things that we would call learning disabilities all the way to a complete inability to uh, read or write or anything. It, it covered all this. It was not very well defined, but they thought they knew it when they saw it, and it was a Mendelian trait. So hered he was a hereditarian, meaning all these important traits were, were hereditary, and they were Mendelian, allowing them to take the information that the field workers got and construct pedigrees. Uh, uh, Jason mentioned that I published two articles, American Biology Teacher. I'm basically talking about one of them today. The other one, which is here, was how the eugenicists misused pedigree analysis, uh, which I don't want to go into because it, it will take me too far afield. But here's a pedigree where they show one, two, three, well, one, two, three, four generations, and they show the appearance of certain uh, traits in humans. F is feeble-minded, E is epileptic, I is insane, and there are others in there, and I forget what they are. I, I haven't really, oh, paralyzed, deformed, and so on. They use pedigree analysis to try to uh, convince themselves and others that all these traits were, were simple Mendelian traits that could be analyzed, followed in pedigrees. And then uh, based on that, they could make recommendations. For example, these people should be prevented from having children. <laughs> Talk way more about that. Such things as the one I keep coming back to is pauperism. They they maintained that pauperism was a genetic trait. You're born poor, and you're always going to be poor because you have a, a genetic defect. Okay, I mentioned that. So that published a book, a very influential book in 1911, called Heredity in Relation to Eugenics. I have that book. This is what I alluded to earlier. I didn't bring it with me because it's it's one from 1911 or I don't know what printing it was, and it's starting to come apart, and I've been trying to get another one, and they're very expensive, so I thought I'd better not be transporting that. And in, it, in addition to all these other things, including feeble minus and epilepsy and all the other things I mentioned, alcoholism, pauperism, he said that. He, it was his firm conviction that races, and when I say race, Today, imagine that I'm putting quotation marks around it, okay? I may, I may pronounce it race. I mean quotation marks around it because biologists do not recognize separate races in human beings. Hum the human species is not divided up into races. It's a concept that doesn't exist in biology. It's maybe a, you know, a sociological uh, construct, 
It doesn't. But they firmly believed that there were separate categories of humans that we could call races that were genetically distinct from each other. All right. Why were they genetically distinct? Because of evolution, because of Darwinian evolution, that races were shaped by evolution over thousands of generations to be adapted to the environment where they lived. So, for example, people like Charles B. Davenport trace his ancestors back to Northern Europe. Actually, another fun fact to know, Charles Davenport could trace his ancestors to someone who was on the Mayflower. OK, that's how how white Anglo-Saxon Protestant he was. He traces uh, roots back to the, the Mayflower. So Northern European people were genetically distinct from people who lived in Africa or in Asia or Native Americans because they had lived there for thousands of generations and evolution has shaped them to be adapted to that environment. And when they were taken out of that environment, they weren't very well adapted. So the, the conclusion was that races there with the quotes were very genetically different and distinct from each other. He then uh, decided that if you took people from widely different races, not for example, oh, I don't know, Scandinavians and Germans, you know, the Danish and the English, no, but races that they considered to be quite genetically different, if, if they had children together, what you would see because of their genetic differences so-called disharmonious genetic combinations in the descendants. That term disharmonious will come up over and over and over again. Therefore, you shouldn't do it. So here's an, here's a, an, here's an analogy. He thought it was a really good one as a zoologist. He had done crosses in chickens. He looked at inheritance in chickens. So we have one type of chicken. By the way, I, I really know nothing about this. This is just something I've read. Don't ask me anything specific, specifically about uh, fowl or poultry. <laughs> A leghorn hen, an indeterminate layer. I know what that means. Like the chickens that we get eggs from, they just lay one egg after another, okay? Indeterminate, they just lay eggs. Then they basically ignore them, right? They don't sit on them. They don't, they don't have that brooding behavior where they go and sit on them so that they hatch. They lay the eggs and off they go. They pay no attention to the eggs from that point onward. That's the leghorn hen. Then there was the Brahma hen, which was quite different. It would lay a much smaller number of eggs, but it would have the brooding instinct. Instinct They become brooding. They would sit on the eggs to warm them. So they hatch. They pay attention to the chicks. They basically had the mothering instinct. What if you cross them? What would you get? The, the, the assumption was these two chicken types had been adapted through many, many generations to be what they were, to adapt to their environment. Although this, you might call this artificial selection rather than natural selection. What are you going to get if you cross it? Everything's going to get all mixed up and all messed up. And in fact, when he did that, I apologize for all words. What he got in the hybrid was, was a chicken that would kind of lay eggs, not as many as, as the, uh, this one, but more than this. And they weren't very good at mothering either. So they weren't, weren't, weren't very good at laying a lot of eggs, and they weren't very good at mothering. It says here they stop mothering after a little while, walk off, and, and allow them to die. The conclusion was clear. Because they were genetically distinct, and, and bred and adapted to have particular behaviors, a hybrid between them failed because it had disharmonious combinations of genes. The instincts and functions of the hybrids were not harmoniously adjusted to each other. There it is. How would that apply to humans? So to explain how it applied to humans, I do have to take you through the, um, the diagram cross. Now, I, I understand that very few of you had genetics. You don't have to understand the cross all that well to get the point here. So I have to keep this moving. I have to keep this moving. Um, this is going to be the basis where Davenport tried to show actual scientific evidence that black people and white people should not have children. Okay. Here's the diagram cross. I said to review, so here it is. This is Mendel's cross. In Pete, we have two distinct traits, two separate traits. One of them is seed color, yellow versus green, and the other is seed shape, round versus wrinkled. These are two Mendelian traits, each controlled by a single gene, and that gene has two forms of the gene alleles. So for seed color, when you have the dominant big G, yellow, that's dominant, that's why it's capitalized. Little g, little g, homozygous recessive is what we say is green. So uh, when you go to get, buy peas in the store, the green peas actually are the recessive phenotype. Yellow is dominant. So that's one. 
One trait, seed color, one gene, dominant, recessive, yellow versus green. A separate trait in the seed, but a separate trait is seed shape. Dominant big W gives round, filled out, right, expanded. Little w, little w gives wrinkled, shriveled up. So two uh, separate traits inherited separately due to two Mendelian genes, each with a dominant recessive. If at, at any point in this you want me to stop and explain more, just, just let me know. I don't want to take too much time on this because the important stuff comes later. So let's take, take you, I'm going to take you through his cross. We start with a parental plant, dominant, dominant, capital letter, capital letter, yellow round. I'm going to cross it with the other parent, which is recessive, recessive, green wrinkle. Can you see that back there? Can you see the different colors in the wrinkles? Can you see it, Jason? You see the wrinkles? Okay. All right. So I've thrown over genetics. That means that one parent is doubly homozygous dominant. Okay. Only dominant allele, big, 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 big. The doubly recessive parental plant is doubly recessive. Little, 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 little. The magic of meiosis produces the gametes, the, the sperm cell and the egg cell, which is what you actually call an implant. The gamete from this parent only has a big G and a big W. That's the only thing you can get. From this parent, the only gamete you can possibly get is little g, little w. So fertilization gives you a single outcome. Um, we call it the F1 generation or hybrid generation. Only one outcome, which is not shown here, but you just got to trust me. It is doubly heterozygous, big G, little g, big W, little w, because of Mendel's principle of dominance, two dominant phenotypes, yellow and round. So far, so good. Questions? That's pretty simple so far. It gets complicated when the F1s, the hybrids, interbreed. Let's say two hybrid plants. They are both yellow round and both, there it is, doubly heterozygous, big G, little g, big W, little w. Now, when these plants produce gametes by the magic of meiosis, they produce four kinds in equal proportions. Four. Four. In equal proportions, one-fourth of each, 25% of each. Big, big. Big, little. Little, big. Little, little. And that's actually how I describe it in my genetics class. Big, big. Big, little. Little, big. Little, little. Both of them. Now, they combine randomly at fertilization to give the next generation called the F2. And here is your Punnett square. I'm going to hit the space bar and fill out my Punnett square. First of all, we put the uh, gametes across the top. Big, 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 little, little, big, little, little. And down the side, same thing. And here we go. The, now, this is the magic of PowerPoint. I don't want to tell you how long it took me to set this up. <laughs> but once you do it one time, you're good for the rest of your life. I always tell my genetic students never to write out a, a 4 by 4 Punnett square. Don't do it because you're going to make a mistake. And I still have my notebook from when I took genetics many, many years ago. It was the 1970s, year of uh, long hair and tight jeans. We don't want to go back there. I have Punnett squares in my notebook where there are erasures all over the place. Because Anyway, where was I? Those are the genotypes. You know, we don't care that much about your genotypes. We care about the phenotypes. Anytime there's at least one big G and at least one big W, dominant, dominant. Dominant yellow, dominant round. Nine out of the 16s. Nine sixteenths, dominant, dominant, yellow round. Three out of the 16s, this one, this one, and this one, have dominant for G, but recessive for W, meaning dominant yellow, recessive wrinkled, three of those. Three more are recessive for G, green, but dominant for W, round, three, green, round. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, only one, only one completely recessive, recessive phenotype, green recessive phenotype wrinkle. Any questions? All right. You're never going to do that. You can summarize it like this. We don't care about the first column. We don't really care about the second column. We care about these two columns. There are four combinations. They are yellow round dominant, dominant, nine sixteenths. Yellow, wrinkled, dominant, recessive, 3 sixteenths. Green, round, recessive, dominant, 3 sixteenths. And green, wrinkled, 1 sixteenth. We can summarize it even more simply as follows. In the F2 generation, that. This is the famous, well, to me anyway, um, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio of phenotypes in the F2 generation of diver cross. 9, 3, 3, 1. 9 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths, 1 sixteenth. This is what we're going to base a lot of what we're going to do on now, or from this point on. 
So here's the standard uh, cross. I don't need to do this again. I'm going to move on. What Davenport and the other early Genesis believed was all these traits in humans, not only were they Mendelian, one gene, dominant recessive, but all these traits were inherited independently, separately, just like seed color and shape in peas. Same thing. Same thing, inherited independently. So it would be possible to inherit a short torso, right? Short torso, I have a re relatively long one, short torso combined with long legs. Because you get one from one parent, one from the other. And honestly, you can't fault them too much for this because we still sometimes talk like this. Oh, you got your, your, uh, you got your long legs from your dad. Oh, you got your, um, I don't know, whatever it would be, broad shoulders from your mom. We think that they're separate that they're separate traits. Um, it doesn't work that way, but they thought so. So here we go. This is where it's gonna start to get uncomfortable. Two different races. Let's say we're not gonna get to black, white yet. We're gonna get there. We have one race, they're big people. They're big, tall people. They're big and they have large internal organs, right? Large body, large organs, right? Adapted through, through uh, thousands of generations of evolution. We have another separate race, that's their quotes. They are short and they have small organs, small bodies, small organs, adapted through uh, thousands of generations of evolution. What happens if they have children together? What's gonna happen? Here we go. To them, it was the same thing as uh, the Mendelian cross. We have one of the parents, it could, be, uh, it could be the mom or the dad, doesn't matter which one it is. They're the big one with the large organs. We're gonna say that that is the dominant. Dominant, dominant, right? Doubly homozygous dominant. The other parent could be mom or dad, doesn't matter. Small body, small organs, doubly homozygous recessive. Giving us in the children, which is equivalent to the F1 generation, there's our double heterozygote. From one parent, big A, big B. The other parent, little A, little B. But because of dominance, the double heterozygote, because of Don Leo A, Don Leo B, they are large body, large organs. Good, right? Everything fits. Everything's harmonious. So far, so good. The problem is, what if those double heterozygotes have children together? They're adapted now, according to Davenport, this is, you know, direct quotes, inter internal organs are well adapted to care for the large frames. What about the next gen? What if they have children together? This is once again equivalent to the diver cross. This is once again going to give us the four gamete types joining randomly, and it's going to give us the four by four Punnett square. Do you want to see it again? Sure you do. <laughs> there it is again. I can now just talk randomly as it spills out. There it is. It's the same thing as before. Instead of yellow seeds, we have large body. Instead of green seeds, we have small body. Instead of round seeds, we have large organs. Instead of wrinkled seeds, we have small organs. There it is. You didn't, don't ever want to write that out because we can summarize it like so. There it is. There's our 9331 ratio, right? Cool. It's, it's genetics. It's science. It's the latest thing. So what, you may say? Disharmonious combinations. The first 316, what is that? Large body but small internal organs. Now, if you think this is ridiculous, you're right, it is. Who could think this? They did. Well, that's a problem. You have a big body, but the internal organs are small? That's a disharmonious combination, in particular. The circulatory system is not going to get enough blood throughout that big body. Poor health and a shortened life. Disharmonious combination. How about the other, How about the other three? Oh, that's small body with large organs. Oops. Small body, there's not enough room for those organs to go in that body. That's a disharmonious combination. So I hope by now you've kind of gotten the idea that this diver cross gets us here, where we have the 916th up there, dominant, dominant. We have the 116th down here, recessive, recessive. It's the threes in the middle that have potentially disharmonious combinations. He pointed out this, he pointed this one out. What if you had a disharmonious uh, combination from a mating between a large, tall Scot, somebody from Scotland, and a small, short, southern Italian? I asked myself, 
Has that ever happened? I want to see a picture. So I found this. I'll give you, ladies and gentlemen, a still photo from the 1964 movie, Woman of Straw was the name of the movie. I don't know if anybody recognizes either of these two actors. On the left, we have Sean Connery, a six foot two strapping Scotsman, right? Was in uh, James Bond and other things. He was in uh, um, the, um, the Harrison Ford movies. And, yeah. Uh, he, by the way, died uh, about two and a half years ago. On the right, we have the lovely Gina Lola Brigida, for a while known as the most beautiful woman in the world. She was from Italy, and she was five feet five. She died in January. Okay, she just, she just died. That would give you, it, not in their children, but in their grandchildren, potentially disharmonious combinations. There it is. It's science. Now, that's kind of funny. You know, you know we can kind of laugh about that, chuckle about their, uh, how naive they were about it, but it, it, it gets worse. Another one he cited was um, two size and jaw size. Clearly separate traits, right? Clearly separate traits. So what if we have somebody with large, large, large jaws, not like me, and large teeth? We're going to assume that those are dominant, right? Doubly homozygous dominant. You're going to have children with somebody with small teeth and small jaw. The problem is not in their children. You know, they're going to be fine. Doubly heterozygous, right? Large teeth, large jaws, dominant, dominant, we're cool. It's in the next generation we could get disharmonious combinations. We could have in the grandchildren for that original mating, we could have people with big teeth in a small jaw, not enough room for the big teeth and small jaw. That's actually kind of like me. I'm from the, I'm old enough, there were no power expanders when I was a kid. So what did they do? If there was not enough room, they pulled teeth. They yanked out, uh, this is getting a little too personal, but they yanked out by cuspids. I'm, I'm missing four teeth because there wasn't enough room. My children got palate expanders. Where was I? That's not a good combination. They're going to be all crooked. I mean, crowded and crooked. My teeth are kind of crowded and crooked as is. What about this one? Small teeth and large jaw, they're going to be widely spaced teeth. That's a mess. They're disharmonious combinations. And Davenport said, well, there's your explanation for why Americans have such poor uh, dental health. Uh, higher instance of irregular teeth in the tremendously, this is hybridized United States. Too many different races of people mixed together in this country, leading to disharmonious combinations. Again, we can chuckle about that one. Uh, now we get to the part that is, as many times as I talk about this, I just, I don't like talking about this. Because we go back to the racist assumptions that Davenport and the other, did I mention they were all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants? They sure were. And they were, they were from well-off families. They were from, um, prestigious families, they got all the best education, they got all the advantages in life. They're the ones who then uh, try to um, justify eugenics based on, on, on racist claims, and here it is. All right, everybody knew that blacks were less intelligent than whites, that everybody knew that. All the, all the IQ tests show that everybody, it's just, it was understood, it was understood. In my course, Social Ethical Issues and Genetics, I talk about how IQ tests came about and how circular reasoning was used to uh, show that the IQ tests were valid because black people got low scores. Black people got low scores because everybody knew they were less intelligent, and round and round it went. So blacks were less intelligent, but it was also assumed that other traits were strictly inherited as well, including one of them was ambition. Ambition. All right, here we go. Here we go. In a paper entitled The Effects of Race Intervening, which I have right here, it's only six pages. If anybody would like a copy of this, I can forward it to you. You can take this and photocopy yourself. There it is from 1917, C.B. Davenport. This is what he said. Race in in intermingling was a really bad idea. There's a paper because of this. Everybody knew. Black people were less intelligent and less ambitious than white people because they didn't seem to really go anywhere in society, right? In 1917. Clearly, it was because of bad heredity. So let's take a cross between a white person on the left, high IQ, high ambition, doubly homozygous dominant. Those are the dominant traits, clearly. Now, black person, low IQ, low ambition. You see, it's the same thing, it's a dihybrid cross. 
the first generation, the offspring, and there were names that they used for offspring between blacks and whites. So I'm not going to use that term anymore. It was used a lot in those days. We're not going to use those terms. We don't use them. What, what do I want to say? You want to go with mixed race? We could go with that if you want. Tend not to label people like that, but if you want, go with that. Well, again, no problem. Why? Because you have a dominant wheel for both, so you're going to have high IQ and, and high ambition. Cool. The next generation, now we see the problem. In the grandchildren, if these people, um, I guess I'll call them mixed race, if they had children together, in the grandchildren of the original cross, what do you get? Disharmonious combinations. One in particular was considered to be a real problem. That was not so much the high IQ and low ambition. All right, you're smart, but you don't do anything with it. But this one, low IQ. It's not smart at all, but highly ambitious. What Davenport said, it's in that paper you can read. <coughs> Those people, this disharmonious combination would be a real problem in society. Social strivers, but not smart enough to do it. That would lead them to crime, and they'd be unhappy, uh, dissatisfied, a nuisance to society, criminals, essentially born criminals. On that basis, it seemed clear that this shouldn't happen. Miscegenation is the term that was used that it spells disharmony. It should not happen. And in fact, in, in Davenport's time, there were laws in many states that made it illegal for white people and black people to get married anyway. So if this was a justification. There are badly put together people. How much of the exceptionally high death rate in middle life in this country due to such bodily maladjustments, crime, insanity? All of this is due to disharmonious combinations of which the ones you'll get between blacks and whites are the worst. I have a little bit more. I'm taking a little longer than I thought. I want to leave a little time. I got. I need another uh, six, seven minutes probably. Question, question. Yeah, in your presentation, you started with body and jaw size. Did yeah. Davenport start with body and jaw size before jumping into race, or did he automatically dive into trying to analyze? He, he didn't care about uh, body size. He didn't care about tooth size or any of that. He just used those as examples of what the diameter cross would tell you would happen. He didn't find that anywhere. He didn't really wasn't really concerned about it. But he wanted to get to this. He I wanted to get that, to the dangerous that was race crossing. Next question. Yeah. So the point was this. The point was race crossing, not small teeth and a large jaw. It was just to get people to believe, oh, this is Mendel, this is science. And now look what happens when we apply it to race crossing. He needed evidence. I mean, this was the theory. It was, it was the latest science. It was Mendel. It was clear, clear as day. I mean, come on, the dive across. What could be clearer than that? He needed evidence. Where was he going to find cases of widespread mating between blacks and whites? Where? Jamaica. Not the United States in 1972, but Jamaica in the 1920s. He got money from the United States State Department, as well as money from rich people, the Carnegie Institution. Went to Kingston, Kingston Town. That's where he went. I, I, I have a colleague at, at, in the department at Slippery Rock. He's from Jamaica. So I say Kingston. Kingston. He went to Kingston. My colleague is from up here. Here's Kingston down there. Anyway, moving on. So he, with his colleagues and workers, went down to Jamaica with government money and rounded up people and measured them every which way. A grand total of 370, which is not that many, categorized them as black. White, brown. Was he going to find problems, not in the whites, not in the blacks, but in the browns, the way his theory said? Here is the punchline you've been waiting for. Measured everything you can imagine. There's a list there. I'm not going to read it to you. Measured not only clearly uh, observable traits, height and, and weight, arm length and finger length, and how wide you are around the ankles and how long your foot is, all those but also try to get information on musical pitch, rhythm, and the ability, this is not the punchline, ability to draw a circle in 30 seconds. I don't know if you can read any of this, uh, uh, color discrimination, uh, musical discrimination, athletic ability, walking gait, how do they walk? All of that, collected all that information. Here comes the punchline. Oh. And then one other thing that they had them do famously was the mannequin test. They presented these people, these Jamaicans, who probably wondered what is going on here, with wooden cutouts that looked like that. 
And then there were time to see how long it took for them to put the two legs down here, put the two arms up here, put the head on top. How long did that take? They measured. And they published it all in a 500 page book. I have a copy of it from 1929. There it is. There it is. 500 pages. Did they find evidence of disharmonious combinations in the descendants of black white babies? Boy, they tried really hard. They found one, though. They found one. Here it is. On average, blacks were taller and had longer arms than whites. What was the difference? A half a centimeter. The arms and legs of blacks average a half a centimeter longer than those of whites. Half a centimeter, which is one fifth of an inch, the average. So what happens in the descendants, the second generation, this disharmonious combination of long legs and short arms? That 3 16 long legs and short arms. Half a centimeter, one fifth of an inch. Let me show you in a minute. There it is. Long legs, short arms, half centimeter. Here's what he said. That would, this is a quote, put them at a disadvantage in picking things up from the ground. I brought this with me to show you what half a centimeter, hang on a second, half a centimeter is that, or a fifth of an inch, same thing, it's the distance between my fingernails. That was it. That was government money and 500 pages to conclude that. You'd have to bend down that much farther to pick something up <laughs> off the ground. All right, this is conclude. I have a few more things to say. <coughs> others didn't find this, okay? Even during that time, others didn't find it. it you have to conclude that this whole thing was shot through uh, with racism, that, that, that all this data collection was, was nonsense, and even what he found trying as hard as he could to find a disharmonious combination, it simply wasn't there. It was criticized by several, including William Castle. Let me show you. Uh, William Castle showed that the whole idea of long legs, uh, arm length and leg length as separate traits, no. No, it's basically one trait, okay? He studied rabbits, and he found, no, it's not inherited separately. There are general factors that give you long arms and long legs together. So he, he, uh, he known disharmonies, and he said this. I want to get, take a... Just a minute on this. We like to think that the Negro, the old term, is inferior, that crosses result in degradation, that the honestly made records tell a very different story about hybrid Jamaicans from that that Davenport and Jennings tell about them. The former, meaning there's no disharmonies, uh, will never reach the eugenicists, okay? They're not going to pay attention, or the congressional committees, but the latter, meaning that these disharmonious combinations exist and, and are a reason to keep the, to prevent black white meetings will be with us as the bogeyman of pure, hang on a second, of, of uh, pure race enthusiasts for the next hundred years. He said that in 1930. Their whole idea of blacks and whites being genetically distinct will be with us for a hundred years. It's been 93. Okay, what can we learn? Ah, uh, simple genetic explanations are almost always wrong. Be very cautious of, oh, there's a gene for this. No, there's not. Okay? We get excited about that. It's always way more complicated. Bias. I mean, this, the, Davenport's work was shot through bi with bias. Eventually, it was revealed. He was discredited and became a fringe figure later in life. They did not accept evidence that falsified their hypotheses. Nope. That's a sign of bad science. And whenever you have even good science, you better be darn cautious about applying it to public policy. Now, why is this important today, these things that happened 100 years ago? Uh, there's a new form of eugenics that exists today, and we have the power to do things that Davenport could not have even dreamed about. I'll just give you two examples really quickly, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. One of them is selecting the traits of your children by matings. No, we're going to do in vitro fertilization. Egg from mom, sperm from dad. We're going to get an embryo. We're going to take a cell out. 
we're going to determine genetically the, the characteristics of that embryo, and then we're going to give the parents the option of which embryos they want to implant. That's been done now for over 20 years, going on 30 years, in particular to keep um, inherited disorders from coming up. But it also opens the door to testing for all sorts of things, and, and people are concerned that it may lead to picking out traits of your children, whether it's height, maybe even musical ability. Who knows? It'd be nice in my case. CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing allows a really powerful way to alter individual genes in people, changing people, um, existing people, and there's a, a success that occurred in the last couple of years with sickle cell anemia. But again, you could do that with, with embryos. You could alter the, the genetic characteristics of an embryo, giving parents the power to potentially alter traits of their children, a new form of eugenics. So with that much, I'm going to uh, answer questions, but I do want to point this out. This was day before yesterday. This is day, be day before yesterday. The National Institutes of Health said, said researchers stop using race as a characteristic in your studies. It's not, it's not a biological category. It, it stop using it as that. Uh, whatever we fund, you better not be using it because it simply doesn't hold up. There are no major genetic differences between what we consider to be races. So now maybe we're coming to our senses a little bit. Okay, at this point, I'd be happy to answer whatever questions. I'm, this probably took a little longer than you wanted, but I can, once I get started, I, I have trouble stopping. I will tell you that I have uh, my article from American Biology Teacher on this. I have a second one on pedigree analysis. I brought six copies. I can uh, make you more or forward them to you. And at this point, any questions you have, I will attempt to answer them. I'll try to use short words. Yes. We have historical evidence that eugenics is the wrong direction to go. We, we know this. It sure didn't work out. It, it, it sure didn't work out. But we seem to be on this crash course with it anyway. Yeah, the original eugenics movement was about uh, government control of the entire population. Now, what I didn't mention, and some of you probably, if you know anything about it, wondering why I didn't mention about how eugenics was adopted by. Uh, by the Nazis, and it led to the extremes of the Holocaust. And once that was repealed in 1945, 1945, eugenics basically ended, or it really went underground. But that was state-sponsored reproductive control of the entire population. What we have now is not that. It's not that. It's more individual people, couples, making choices that could be interpreted as a new form of eugenics, a power there to do that. But should we have that power? I don't know what you think. In my course, if somebody says we should do that, I'm going to say why? Why not? Why not give parents the option of picking out the sex of a child? Who do you need for fertilization to prevent cystic fibrosis from occurring in the children? Why not let them uh, decide on sex? Why not let them test for other things that would give an idea of height or or uh, susceptibility to cancers or Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia? Why not? We can test now for several hundred genes all at once. Taking one cell from an embryo during not giving for fertilization, why not? Who's harmed by it? Who's helped by it? Who's harmed by it? Is yeah. it wrong? Why don't we open this question to all of you? I mean, what do you think the end result of this could be? Where, what direction are we going with this science? We just make our own people. And what would those people look like? Like you just. Building your own character. I mean, isn't there, isn't there an example in, uh, in Gregor Mandel himself who suffered from clinical depression? Oh, absolutely. If, if, if that could be something you could take out mm -hmm. from an embryo, you might never get a Gregor Mandel. Yeah, that's or true. you might never get a, uh, you know, a uh, Vincent Van Gogh who, who he just lived with a cut off. Kind of yeah. So these are traits that might get that might be associated with a certain kind of genius mm -hmm. that might never happen. Yeah, many people brought this up that um, certain things that we consider as mental disorders seem to be associated with artistic uh, expression. Or well, Beethoven. I mean, you went deaf. Do we want to root out the tendency to become deaf in your in your forties? He's, he's been hockey. Well, see the hockey. Yeah, I mean there are lots and lots and lots of them. It also separates from your core. Yeah. There's only the rich people are going to be a little. Tough. There's another very good one that some people are worried we're going to end up stratifying society into those the upper crust, the one percent of one percent that can do all this, and they'll never have just uh, the hair disorders, and then all the rest of the people 
it really was. And then they would be more discriminated against because they had technology to, to prevent inherited disorders from occurring, but they just didn't have the money. That's a good, good there's going to be a genetic have and have nots in society. I mean, we already have have and have nots based on money. There are lots of things rich people can do, I can't do, or you. Is it going to be the same thing when it comes to heredity? How, how did they explain the enablement? Criminals who had white parents on both sides for generations, how did they describe or explain those? Well, criminality can still be still occur in a racially homogeneous population. I mean, that was first described in, in Italy with uh, the idea of one criminal that could be identified by their physical features. But it was made worse when there was race crossing. When it was assumed that certain ethnic groups, geographical groups, were more prone to criminality than others. For example, I don't want to insult anybody, but people of uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, in particular Southern Europe, were considered to have a much uh, higher likelihood of becoming criminals. Of course, it was never really considered that th those people that came to the country had no um, economic opportunities and they turned to crime because they needed the money to feed their children. I mean, that didn't really enter into it. So, even in a genetically homogeneous population, but when you throw the United States and the ethnic diversity, then it just amplifies. It seems like there's just a lot of confirmation bias. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Confirmation bias is all over everything in eugenics. Whether it's this, or whether it's pedigree analysis, they expected to see an outcome, and by golly, they saw it. Can you explain what confirmation yes. bias is for us? When you go, I'll try. <laughs> when you, you can help me if, if I don't get it right. If, if you, you have a um, particular viewpoint, and you go into a study, and you have an expected outcome, and you tend to uh, fixate on the outcomes that support your pre-existing notions of bias, and you ignore the ones, discount the ones that don't support your idea. Right? Confirmation bias, it happens a lot, and just generally, that uh, I can't. But I can't give you an example off the top of my head. That if, uh, oh, geez. Oh, I'd be good with that. Horoscopes, okay? You read horoscopes, I don't read horoscopes every day, it's waste time. But if you do, uh, most of the time, what your horoscope says doesn't really match what happens in your life. But the times it does, you fixate on that. You, you then um, think horoscopes actually have value because of the time that it did match up what happened. That's confirmation bias. You have any of that? That's not very okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever uh, you expect uh, you know, there to be a problem with, with two race groups intermingling, and you can't find any problems, but you know what? There is about a fifth of a centimeter, you know, <laughs> difference between them. Half a centimeter, fifth of an inch. That is, that is clearly the, the biggest issue here. Ignore that we haven't found anything else, but that uh, one thing. That one fifth of an inch, man. Now I don't like. I don't want to get into this too much, but clear that whenever the police interact with the public, certain racial ethnic groups tend to be arrested at a higher rate, tend to be uh, dealt with physically at a higher rate, and police may have it may be confirmation bias. They expect certain ethnic groups to be more criminally inclined. I, I can see it right there. I, I don't want to get into that. I'm a biologist, okay? I'm not a sociologist. I'm a biologist. But I've just seen some, some data recently on that. And it's, it's the differences in how police treat people are pretty dramatic when, when, you, when you look at it. Okay, fine. I don't think about that. Can I ask you one other question? Actually, it seems like you could, I was thinking about it, it seems like you could, you could break the, the whole idea of eugenics into, like, I was thinking of, like, kind of two ideas. One, is that we could try to improve the human race. Yes. So we could use genetics, our knowledge of inheritance, at that time was primitive compared to what it is now, to try to improve the human race. And the second, the second issue is we choose, is choosing which traits are the good traits. Absolutely. And so um, is that we, we know that by choosing which traits are the good traits, that was not done well back in that period of time. And neither really was trying to improve the human race through heredity, but today, we could certainly manipulate heredity in a way we couldn't before. Are we any more enlightened to choose good traits? Oh, I, that's a good question. And you can always say, well, cystic fibrosis. If, if parents are both carriers, there's a one-fourth chance every child they have will have a devastating inherited source of cystic fibrosis with a life expectancy of, I don't know, 
world. I don't know what it is now. Let's call it 30 years. Do we want, do we, would you want to have a child with cystic fibrosis? Most people would say no. We have the technology to keep that from happening by in vitro fertilization, taking embryos, test them. Is that a good thing? Could we all agree that that's a good thing? In my class, I just gave them a survey, and the large majority would agree that's a good thing. Okay? But if you take it to the next step, and the step after, at what point do you get to the, get to the situation where it gets hazy, it's a, it's a gray area, and maybe people look back in 20, 30, 50, 100 years and realize these people were stupid. And they had biases, and they had prejudices, and they were naive, and they did things they shouldn't do. I don't know. I, I'm not good at predicting the future. I will tell you that in my lifetime, and I've been around more than anybody else in this room, um, there have been several new eugenics, okay, with in vitro fertilization, new eugenics. Didn't turn out that way. What, uh, cloning, when it came around, new eugenics? No, no, it didn't happen. Genetic testing, new eugenics. Did it really? Uh, now we have, you know, genetic testing, we have gene, gene editing. Is that, gonna, is that now going to be our new eugenics? I tend to have a little more, more faith in the humans that they will make good decisions for their own children and families. I don't, uh, this is just my opinion. I, I, I'm not worried about the government ever trying to impose things like this. But, I'm, maybe I'm not here. 50 years from now, whenever you are on my age, you look back and that shot little guy, he was full of it. <laughs> How could he think that? Again, you just thought they were doing the best, not necessarily for themselves, but for humans. You know, the human species. Of course, the human species, they meant white Anglo Saxon Protestants, but still. So, Davenport obviously never met Frederick Douglass. <laughs> no, no, no lifetimes. Or his contemporaries. Two <laughs> boys now. So, in terms of, I think, and this is true with a lot of other issues too, that there's a moral compass among the largest section of population that says, okay, if we can use genetics to just to get rid of hereditary disease, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anybody that would say that's a bad thing, whether it's sickle cell anemia or muscular dystrophy or any of these things that affect, you know, autism, for example, or, you know, if all of these are genetically manipulatable, if that's the right word, then, you know, I think there's, you know, there's some kind of a, not a line exactly, that's not the right word, but, you know, there are some things in society that everybody agrees upon. We can name certain things and everybody would agree that that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, in, so, in Davenport's era, everybody agreed that blacks were less intelligent than whites. So it, it shifts. I just know this from t-shirt. Show it. Just, here's oh. your t-shirt. <laughs> Say with Gregor Mendel. Oh That's extra points right there. <laughs> um, we have a question. Someone sent me a question okay. to uh, another chat thing that we have. Um, if any particular group continues to select for particular traits and then potentially interbreeding with others that have done this selection too, would they not be possibly susceptible to other, as yet, unknown, unrecognized, or wholly new genetic, genetic mutations, either due to the regular operation of gene expression or due to possible environmental gene switching triggers? Well, that's a complicated question. I, I, my short answer would be yes. <laughs> my short answer would be yes, if I understand the question. That it's, it's impossible to, to know in 2023 uh, the role of all, whatever it is, 17,000 genes in the human genome and how they interact. So in trying to eliminate certain genotypes that result in inherited disorders, we may unknowingly cause problems if we were able to eliminate particular alleles. Maybe there are certain circumstances where they might be beneficial people and we didn't know it. And there's some suggestive evidence that that's the case. So yeah, we'll never have enough knowledge to do this uh, and be right all the time. I, I, we, we simply don't know enough about genetics. I don't know when we ever will know enough. In, in you know, 1911, they thought they knew enough. They didn't. In 2023, we sometimes think we know enough. We definitely don't. 
So that's a very good question. You really don't know. Um, not a question. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, you made this uh, um, this discussion uh, um, uh, way uh, um, way more uh, engaging and entertaining than I ever thought it would. <laughs> Thank you. It wasn't too long. Yeah, no, it wasn't. I got to look at the clock with all of these. I got to wrap this up. Let's, you. let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> we also have, uh, I think this is a party gift, I think. Is that right? Stacy, yeah, this is Kate. Oh, what about the umbrella? The umbrella, too. Oh, the umbrella, too? Yeah. <laughs> is this a, a logo umbrella? Uh huh, this is a CCBC umbrella. No way! Yeah, so um, every time it rains, you'll think of us. We also I kept have, tripping over it. Right. And we have a, a notebook here. Oh, and pen. So anytime you have an idea, you could also. Uh, okay, I do have one question for you. I told somebody I was coming to the Community College of, of Beaver County, and they said, oh, they didn't say C CCBC. Kakabaka. What'd they say? Kakabaka. Kakabaka. That's what it was. <laughs> I will treasure this. Kakabaka. Thank you so much. And, you know, I had a good time. I have plenty more I can talk about. If you want me to come back, just let me know. I'd be happy to. Since I now know I can drive here in my car, not get, not get lost. Uh, many of these things I'd like to talk about more, and I certainly could if you'd ever want to have me back. <laughs>